Coming up on Extra Credit, a health educator helps us make better choices, a hands-on learning experience that shows us what we can do with math and science, and one of MSU's athletic trainers shows us how they help athletes perform at the highest level. Stay tuned. Welcome to Extra Credit, where we meet interesting people, explore new ideas, and discover fun places together. I'm your host, Kenneth, and it's a beautiful day for some extra credit. Athletes are generally looked up to as heroes. How could they not be? They perform great feats of strength and speed, you know. But have you ever wondered who helps keep them as strong and as healthy as they need to be? In our first segment, an athletic trainer from Michigan State University shows us how. Are you curious about careers in science? Hi, I'm Genesis, and today I'm here with Luann Jefferson. Luann, can you tell me where we are and what you do here? Today, we're at Michigan State University in the Sports Medicine and Performance Center, better known as the Athletic Training Room. I work at the collegiate level, and the teams that I'm responsible for are women's basketball and men's golf. What does an athletic trainer do? Athletic trainers are highly skilled healthcare professionals and care for any athletic injury or any persons that are active. What's important for athletes to do to help them be successful? Number one is hydration. Number two is sleep. Number three is they have to practice very often. How do you treat an athlete who's been injured? Someone's coming back from an injury and they're not exactly weight bearing yet, then we'll have them in the pool because the buoyancy helps them float and takes the stress off. I wish I had a cool pool like this. How is STEM incorporated in your career? Athletic training, the perfect marriage between athletics and medicine. STEM is what athletic training is based on. There are multiple studies to help us understand the body and how it heals. Good job. Be sure to take your math classes, your biology classes, so that you'll be ready for your college classes. How do you help an athlete's muscles heal? We help athletes' muscles recover from injury in a variety of different ways. If they're tight, we'll have them stretch. If they're weak, we'll have them lift weights. This time, toss the ball to each other and go just three steps. We'll use equipment such as resistance bands. Good job. <laughs> we'll actually use taping as well in order to support athletes. How about that? Are you gonna tape someone? Yes. Tape can be very beneficial. There you go. It's something that we use on a daily basis. What do you think? It's really good. Good job. That's a wrap with athletic trainer Luann Jefferson. Explore your possibilities. Who likes a good mystery? Well, I know I do. In our next segment, a research scientist from the Detroit Institute of Arts shows us how curators and art historians use modern technology to solve mysteries about art. I'm about to take you on a virtual field trip where the regular public can't usually go. Behind the scenes at the DIA. Let's go check it out. We're meeting with Kathy Selvius Daru. She's a research scientist at the DIA. Oh. Hi, are you Hi. Morgan? Yeah. Oh, come on in. This is a sculpture of St. Francis, and we have questions about the history of the painted surface. This sculpture is about 400 years old, and we're interested to find out uh, the pigments that were used to paint the surface of this sculpture. What do you mean by pigments? Pigments are the colorants that are used to create a painting. The color you see on this sculpture, 400 years ago, most pigments that were used by artists were from the earth. They were mineral-based oh. that were ground up to a very fine powder and then mixed with some sort of binding medium and then painted on the surface of St. Francis or even on a painting. Now why are we looking at the pigments? Well, we, ha we have questions about the surface on St. Francis. This is paint over wood. We know that he's a wooden sculpture. And we're wondering if 
the painted surface that we see today is the original surface or not. The workhorse instrument is an instrument known as an X-ray fluorescence spectrometer. We typically refer to it as XRF. XRF, remember that. X-ray fluorescence spectrometer. Okay. And what it does is it gives us information about the elements in a material. And by elements I mean, is there iron in this pigment? Is there copper in this pigment? Understanding the elements present helps you figure out what pigments could likely be present. It is totally non-destructive, the technique. Nothing touches the object. Okay. We just fire a very narrowly focused x-ray beam at the surface of uh, the object. How about we check out an XRF spectrum? The x-rays will come out this little red-tipped orifice here. This is a video-guided uh, system. And the x-ray beams will hit exactly where crosshairs and uh, the laser pointer intersect. She tries to align the laser and the crosshairs together so she can get that perfect, perfect point. So I'm there. She did it. Okay. So this graph is showing us what elements are present in the paint. So how many times do you do this? Can you tell us? In the case of this particular sculpture, I took more than 20 spectra from various locations on the sculpture of St. Francis. We're looking at St. Francis's knuckle. Okay. And we're trying to figure out which pigments are present. And when I see this sort of pattern here, they indicate the presence of lead. But then there's this one here. They're very close to the lead peaks, but they're very distinctive and indicate the presence of mercury. You know, this is primarily lead white with the presence of mercury to give it that, that pinkish hue. And okay. the uh, mercury red, the mercuric sulfide red, that would have been mixed with uh, lead white to create the pink surface of his knuckle. So if we go back into uh, the XRF room and we pull St. Francis away, have another look at the knuckle okay. and you will see that There's... it's pink. So what did you ultimately learn from all the research you did on St. Francis? What we learned that the painted surface that you see on St. Francis right now is not the original surface, uh, that the painted surface that you see now was applied sometime uh, around the late 18th century or later. So Kathy, what subjects does somebody have to study to do what you do? Chemistry, physics, biology, okay. geology, and That's then... pretty much all the science, right? All, 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 all of the sciences. Okay. All of the sciences influence conservation science, and then it helps to have a ferocious curiosity, too. Okay. So, now, take a look at that knuckle. Yeah. What do you see? Pink, mercury, it's pink. Yeah, yeah so you pink. have the mercury sulfide red mixed with the lead white to give that pinkish flesh tone. Thank you so much, Kathy. This has been so much fun, but it has me a bit peckish at the moment. Come to think of it, I could really go for a snack right now. Mmm, much better. In our next segment, a Kellogg Company packaging engineer is going to show us how their day-to-day -day life with math and science can be very delicious. Are you curious about careers in science? Hi, it's Jenilyn, and today I'm here with packaging engineer Karen Keeter. Karen, 
What do you do and where are we today? I am a senior packaging engineer at Kellogg Company and I support the frozen foods veggie business. Today we're here at the Michigan State University School of Packaging where I earned my packaging science degree. This is an example of one of the labs I learned packaging science in. As a packaging engineer, I design packages by understanding the material and the containers they need to go into. So at Kellogg, we make things like Pop-Tarts and Nutri-Grain bars and cereal and Eggo waffles. There is a laser that applies the score here, which makes it super easy to open. You think about the size and shape of the food. We need to come up with the size package it needs to go into. We have to figure out the kind of materials it needs to go in to keep it safe. And then ultimately, I need to understand how to get it from where we make it to the store shelf so you can purchase it. Typically you find the date code somewhere on the package and this will tell you when it was made, where it was made, and it will tell you how long it's good for. How is STEM incorporated in packaging? STEM is incorporated into packaging every single day. For example, I use math every day to figure out dimensions of packages. I also use science and technology to understand materials and how I keep food safe. You don't want soggy cereal at the end of the day, so those materials keep the moisture out of your package. And then I use engineering to do what I do on paper, but then figure out how it goes on a big production line. How did you become interested in packaging as a career? I became interested in packaging because I really love science and engineering, but I also really enjoyed business, so marketing and advertising. So I thought packaging was an amazing blend of the two. You've been waiting to do that all day, haven't you? <laughs> it was a real treat learning all about packaging with Karen Keeter from Kellogg's. Explore your possibilities. Stick around and don't leave just yet. <laughs> In our next segment, a forester extends a branch to us to tell us how they identify trees and use the information to manage our forests. Say, do you ever wonder how it is that foresters know how to identify trees just by looking at them quickly? You know, they weren't born with that knowledge. So stay tuned. We're going to discover an interesting and a fun way to learn how to identify trees all by yourself this episode of Believe It or Not. really incredible that Michigan has over 75 tree species in the forest and even more in cities and people's backyards and you can learn to identify them. Yeah, do you remember our first tree ID episode where we started out by defining what a tree is? Yeah, so at least 30 feet tall and a single stem. And that means things like bamboo isn't a tree because that's grass and palm trees really aren't trees because they don't have woody tissue. Well, so then this is definitely a tree. Yeah, I would say that that would qualify as a tree. So let's talk about how to identify trees. People really like to know who's who out there in the forest. That's true. And you can't really understand how a forest works or to begin to manage a forest unless you know who the players are. Yeah, because different trees have different values and different environmental benefits, and knowing who's who and what's what out there can be very helpful. And this is just plain fun. When we're talking about tree species in the Great Lakes area, if you can identify 10 different species, you'll know most of the trees that you'll find in the forest. So Georgia, what do you look for when you try to identify the species of a tree? We can start with bark patterns, leaf bud shapes and colors, opposite or alternate branching, uh, fruits or seeds, and, and... Leaves, Georgia. Leaves. At least during the growing season, that is. To get started with tree identification, it's easiest to start with the conifers. They have leaves too, you know. And there are only about 20 different species of conifers in the Great Lakes area. These are needles, and this is a broadleaf. It's amazing how many things you can see in a leaf that will help you identify a tree species. To start with, leaves come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, not to mention different shades of green. They can be heart-shaped, hand-shaped, round, oval, narrow, wide. Or shiny, 
dull, even hairy. And look at the edges of the leaves. They can be smooth or have teeth. Those are called serrations. They also can have what foresters call lobes, kind of like your ear, and sinuses, but not like your nose. The leaf attaches directly to a wooden twig. Sometimes there is more than one leaf on the stem, called leaflets. If the leaf has more than one leaflet, then we call it a compound leaf. If there's just one leaf, well, that's a simple leaf. Leaves also have different vein patterns to help identify trees, but we're not going to get into that today. So the easiest way to learn tree ID is to hang out with someone who already knows them. However, if you want to learn on your own, you can use a tree ID book and page through lots of pictures. Or we could use what you call a dichotomous key. And what is that? Well, it's just basically taking a sample of a leaf and making comparisons one by one to see what kind of different features we have and narrow down our choices so we can decide what kind of tree we have. So, thinking back earlier, we saw this picture of a baby tree. Well, what kind of tree is that? We could look through the tree ID book for a while or we can try this dichotomous key. Let's give it a try. All right, so we have one sample here and the first thing we look at is the leaf itself. Is it a needle-like leaf or is it a broad leaf? Well, it looks to me like it's a broad leaf. All right, so the next choice is basically we have either is it a simple leaf or a compound leaf? Well, if you look at the leaf itself, it's just basically one leaf attached to a stem attached to the branch. So that means it's a simple leaf, not a compound leaf. So we don't have to worry about the compound leaves anymore. So what our next choice is basically where those leaves are arranged on the branch. So are they arranged opposite from each other or alternately? Well, it's kind of hard to see in our baby tree, but it turns out that that's alternate branching, not opposite. So we don't have to worry about any trees that have opposite branching. All right. Now our next choice is basically looking at the leaf itself. Does it have those lobes like your ear? Or are they basically just straight, you know, there are no lobes, okay? Let me just say no lobes. Well, it looks to me like we have lobes, not this one. So we can not worry about those kind of leaves or that kind of tree, all right? So we have lobes. Now the last thing we decide is basically are they pointed lobes or are they rounded lobes? Well, they look like they're rounded lobes, don't they? So we don't have to worry about pointed lobe trees. So we're down to our final decision. And so what kind of tree is it? Well, it's a white oak. Ta-da! Now I wonder how Brittany's doing with her tree ID book. Huh. Yes! I got it! I got it! <laughs> All these great tools can really make tree identification a lot less mysterious. That's right, Georgia. But even with the tools, it takes some practice to learn how to use them, which means you might need to get out in the woods. Or you could start in your own backyard or a local park. All you have to do is look up and look around. Look, there's some trees over there. We could identify those. Or some over there too. Oh yeah, and, and then there's some there too, look. How many trees can you identify? Give it a try. You just might find it's fun. Hi, my name is Dr. S. I am very proud of my job because I care for how people feel, think, and behave. I am a counselor. <coughs> Counselors help people of all ages explore their feelings and goals. There are many types of counselors. Mental health counselors help us understand our big feelings. They help people when they are feeling sad, angry, scared, or worried. They listen, help us understand what happened, and work with us on how to feel better. Grief counselors help you understand and cope with your feelings 
if a loved one or a pet in your family dies or goes away. School counselors help with understanding your feelings, how to make good choices with your friends, and how to set goals in school and planning your future. <coughs> counselors work in a doctor's office, a hospital, your school, or even sometimes a community center or library. A counselor's office is a safe place where you can learn about feelings and talk about the things that make you you. When you go into a counselor's office, you might sit in a chair and talk, work with a group of other kids, or even play with toys. In addition to counselors, there are many other helpers like social workers, psychologists, and therapists who all work in mental health careers. I like my job because I get to help you on your journey through life. <coughs> Counselors are important helpers in our neighborhood because we help people learn about themselves and the world around us. So what's my job? To help you feel better about yourself. What's your job? To share your feelings. To meet other helpers in our neighborhood, go to meetthehelpers.org. Meet the Helpers is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Thanks to modern technology, science can be much more fun to learn about. The Michigan Science Center isn't just textbook and boring classrooms, it is an interactive experience. Next up, the director of the Michigan Science Center will give us a tour and encourage us to explore our possibilities. careers in science? Hi, it's Jenna Lynn, and I'm here with Dr. Tanya Matthews. So where are we today? We are at the Michigan Science Center. So a science center is a cool, dynamic, hands-on kind of learning place. So we can show you what you do with math and what you do with engineering. So how can kids become a scientist like you? Think about what you want to do with it. Do you want to build something or fix something or save something? And that will then help you figure out what kind of scientist you want to be. We need as many people involved as possible because we really need girls and everyone else on board to do all the amazing things that we're going to be doing with STEM. I had an awesome day at the Michigan Science Center. Explore your possibilities. We're going to be drawing uh, artwork that is inspired by artist Alma Thomas. If you're not familiar with her work, you can see examples of her work here. Uh, she was an African American artist and is really well known for her abstract, colorful artwork that you can see. And she was a really just a phenomenal role model for both women as well as African American artists. And she had she was a first African-American woman to have her artwork on display at the Whitney Museum in New York. And she also even had her artwork on display at the uh, uh, White House at times, which is really uh, quite incredible. So she has left quite the legacy in the art world. So I'm going to be making two different examples here of um, her style. So here you can see I've already started and the process, it, but um, of just kind of looking at the different colors that I want to use, you can do this with marker or even cut up little pieces of paper. The idea here is going to um, be that you're going to want to make some kind of design. Again, feel free to pause and go back to the beginning of the video. And what I'm doing here for this design is I'm going to go for kind of a radial design. What that means is I'm starting in the center with kind of a circle. So I've got um, somewhat of a circular shape anyway, a little lumpy, but that's all right. And I'm using a bunch of different little rectangles 
Um, and again, you could do this with marker just by coloring in that little shape, or you could cut it out with pieces of paper or even tissue paper or something like that. You can be really creative. Uh, if you don't have con construction paper at home, you know, if you have an old magazine or something, you can really search through the magazine to try to find some fun, unique colors. Now, as you saw at the beginning, uh, Alma Thomas really has done or did several different designs. They're not all, um, you know, circular or anything. There's a lots of different cool abstract designs. So feel free to look up uh, her more of her artwork so that you can see other examples. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start one more that's based on um, still another abstract design, of course, but it's a little bit more linear, just focusing on some relatively straight lines anyway with stripes of different colors. So you can see how in some cases I'm letting my different little marker blocks touch and then some of them are um, more spaced further apart. So again, choose a colorful color scheme to kind of, you know, feel that, that the style that she's really going for in her artwork um, but you can make a design of your choice of course or you could always look back to some of um, the artist's work and try to create a study meaning you kind of copy I guess um, one of the original works of art so that you can really try to uh, really imitate the style of the artist. So I hope that you have enjoyed today's video and you are able to make some really fun, colorful creations today. Thank you all for joining me today on Extra Credit. I'll catch you cool cats on the other side. This program is made possible in part by Michigan Department of Education, the state of Michigan, and by viewers like you.